Um, and then I'm going to say, uh, just to do a, a sort of a tiny recap from, from the yesterday and, and, and a bit about today. Um, so I, we, we had four sessions yesterday and I just touching on the today's topic about learning. Uh, we did both hear about learning uh, in terms of the, its importance uh, in the front lines yesterday, as well as uh, in its importance uh, in how it, it being embedded in the way we operate, um, particularly in the conversation with yesterday night uh, about the future of uh, uh, the public service um, and in the education of such. Um, it, it was a very strong emphasis. Um, and later today, we have a session uh, that's focused on the R&D capacity, uh, both uh, the organizational R&D capacity, as well as uh, the, the sector-wide uh, uh, mobilization uh, of people and organization coming together to, to research and develop uh, new ways of doing things uh, in, in, in public services uh, and beyond. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say that, that this topic, uh, creating a learning organization, is a, is, is a central one to this entire gathering. Uh, and we've been really lucky uh, both to be working with, but also to be following uh, the work of the UNDP uh, Accelerator Labs uh, in, in engaging with this challenge of creating a learning organization. Um, but is frankly, uh, uh, also, uh, we can recognize that they're doing pioneering work, uh, not just in rethinking, but also in experimenting with new ways of, of enabling learning, new ways of, of integrating learning into to operational uh, models, and new ways of, uh, you know, creating relationships, uh, you know, in networks and networks of networks, uh, where learning is the central focal point. So we are really lucky to be hearing from Bas Lourdes and, and Gina Lucarelli today to share their work in progress uh, on how to create a learning organization. And um, I'm basically just gonna hand it over to, to you two to, to take it from here. And, and yeah, just thank you so much for, for being a part of this and, and uh, looking forward to this session. So over to you. Um, great, uh, thanks uh, Jesper and James uh, as well. Uh, and also thank you for inviting us. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, and I'm really glad to see actually a few people from the labs. Uh, Nadia, hello. I'm, I don't see the full list, so I might miss a few names and some colleagues from the global team, Edu, uh, Emily. And I'm really chuffed to see some some of my former colleagues from Nesta, uh, Marika and uh, and Lou. So that's a kind of uh, nice way uh, to, to see and meet again. Um, I'm Bas Lewis. I'm the lead learning designer uh, of the Accelerator Lab network. And um, I work together with Gina. Uh, we are kind of part of the global team. Uh, and um, we are kind of, I wouldn't say building, but stewarding or whatever uh, you might call it, um, a, a learning network of 91 labs. Um, maybe Gina, you can introduce yourself quickly as well. Hi, everybody. I'm Gina. Um, and I'd love to, I'm a little bit new to the States of Change community. So if you want to pop in the chat, kind of who you are and where you're working, that would be great to see as we kick off this conversation. So yeah, Gina and I kind of, uh, uh, I think uh, we were there with in the early days uh, when we, uh, uh, when the, the Accelerator Lab network was learned, uh, was launched. And it's been quite a journey uh, ever since. And so what we'll kind of discuss um, in, in this session is kind of uh, how we got about where we are now, a uh, bit of um, how we drive learning, uh, in, in a, how we kind of build a network, how we drive learning in that network, a little bit about uh, what we're learning. Uh, and we also um, give a bit of a peek into the future um, uh, of what we're, we're hoping to, uh, to embark on. And uh, Anna Marie, by the way, uh, I spoke to your uh, colleague um, from the Red Cross uh, a couple of weeks ago in uh, in Istanbul. Um, so indirectly, we have a few friends together. Um, anyway, so let me get my slides. Um, 
Oh, am I sharing my screen? Probably not, right? No, we're still waiting for this. Here we go. Yeah, I'm not stating the obvious. Can you see my screen? I assume you can. So yeah, um, let me kind of start with a, a bit of very short introduction uh, about the Accelerator Lab network. Um, it's a, it's a, currently we are 91 labs uh, scattered across the globe, uh, primarily in, in, in the global south. Um, so UNDP has 168 country offices, I believe. Um, the numbers might vary. Um, and the labs are embedded in, uh, in these country offices. Uh, and um, basically they work in a very diverse uh, areas. Uh, it can be in middle income countries as well as uh, um, crisis uh, areas. Um, so in the labs work with, uh, let's say the project teams on the ground, uh, as well as with uh, the local stakeholders on uh, pressing development challenges. So, um, and I kind of already hinted towards something like it's, it's we, you might say it's a network of labs, but sometimes we also talk about it as a, uh, as a network of, of local or learning ecosystems, uh, because that's kind of a bit what the labs do. It's, it's like they curate these uh, local learning or learning ecosystems at a local level, uh, learning about these development challenges and uh, trying to, to tackle them. Uh, there is an interesting article from Liz uh, Altman, which I'll pop in a chat later. And uh, it might be worth uh, reading on that. Um, so it's, it's also one thing to point out is um, I'm conscious that there are quite a few innovation networks out there uh, in uh, public innovation, uh, Laboratorio de Gobierno in Chile, uh, in Australia, Victoria, and there's, uh, I believe in Australia in general, there is an overarching uh, innovation network. Uh, there's, there's quite a few out there. And this has some of the traits of uh, an innovation network, which I often kind of see, it's kind of like, it's advocating for innovation, it's building capacity, uh, it's advancing the practice within, uh, within the public sector. Um, but we are specifically labeled as a learning network. Uh, so the prime focus of what we do uh, is learning. Uh, and yeah, but also, I mean, kind of trying to advance a practice and trying to embed that within uh, the organization uh, and the governments we work with uh, is also kind of part of uh, what we try to do. Uh, but learning is the, uh, the main, uh, the, the key word of, uh, of our work. So with 91 labs, um, that's, uh, that, that's a lot. It's really a lot. Um, I remember when, uh, when I had my job interview and Gina, the first very obvious question she asked, so why would, why would you like to join the Accelerator Lab Network? And I said to Gina, Gina, listen, this is so incredibly bonkers uh, to build a network with uh, 60 labs. It was then, that was the first cohort uh, in one go. Uh, that's, um, I can't say no to this. Uh, I mean, this is a once in a life opportunity. Um, but where it actually started is that uh, Akim, our administrator, um, when he came into office, he, uh, of course, as uh, many executives do, uh, they kind of talked to a lot of people and uh, traveled around. And uh, one of the things he learned that there was quite a bit of innovation already happening uh, at UNDP. Uh, but you might say it was kind of happening uh, in pockets. Uh, and, and often it was kind of happening at the fringes of the day or the week. Uh, so people were doing that, uh, uh, let's say, outside office hours. And, and he felt, given also the fact that uh, how the world was changing, um, that innovation might need to become a priority. So the obvious thing to do would probably be to, to start with one or maybe five or kind of expand some of these ideas of the labs that were based. There were already kind of labs uh, uh, in, in various regions, um, but to prototype this. Uh, this is not how it was done. Uh, basically, uh, Gina, I, and then uh, quite a few other colleagues, uh, we were asked to do that in six months. 
uh, actually even less, but it took us about six months to recruit and uh, set up the network initially, uh, which is insanely fast uh, if, you, if you are familiar with uh, some of the procedures uh, within the UN. Um, so in a way, this, this was kind of set up as a real big and bold uh, experiment. Um, and in a way to reimagine uh, how development uh, can be done. So this is not only kind of to reform you and the P, but also to kind of imagine, reimagine that uh, what next generation uh, development practice might look like. Uh, and this is kind of one of the things that uh, uh, Akim said in the early days that uh, this is a bold experiment and let a thousand flowers bloom, uh, which I always kind of took to my heart because it's, uh, I always kind of felt that this is, we're not going to, this is not about having 91 roses or tulips, uh, but there should be some sort of variety. And I think that diversity is, uh, is crucial uh, to, uh, to the network. Of course, there are things that we have in common that all the labs have in common, um, but it's uh, the variety because all the labs also work in, uh, in different contexts as well, which is important uh, to, to be able to kind of adapt to these different contexts. So, and one of the reasons also why uh, why Akim felt was we need something bigger uh, than just one lab uh, is that when we look at uh, and that's kind of what was in the in, uh, in the initial plan is kind of this idea of that the world is changing faster and faster. And although UNDP and our partners and the governments we work with, there is progress but certainly not fast enough. So the idea is also here that, um, and this is almost kind of like the main work and assumption that, that if we can accelerate learning uh, on these uh, development challenges, uh, then we can also adapt to that pace uh, of change uh, we see. Uh, and this is in order to achieve uh, the agenda 2030, uh, which is ambitious uh, and still time is ticking. Uh, but I think also since the plan was written three years ago uh, and we kind of started uh, implementing it two and a half years ago, uh, the world has changed significantly. Um, uh, COVID is, is the kind of obvious thing to mention, uh, but we also see how climate uh, affects the everyday lives of, uh, of people uh, and, uh, and communities and how that also pushes people uh, further into uh, poverty. So the premise here is to how do we adapt to the change where we believe we do that by accelerating learning because many of these development challenges are very, very com complex. So where learning is, is kind of almost like uh, the obvious answer. Uh, but as Toby Lowe, uh, we, he joined our global call yesterday. He said, learning is the, is the strategy uh, to achieve outcomes uh, in complexity. And that accelerate learning, we do that by strengthening our capabilities. And we recruited new talent for that. And these are basically people uh, who form the foundation uh, of the labs. So each lab has three roles. Uh, and this is kind of one of the, the things that all the labs share. Um, so there is a head, of, uh, a head of solutions mapping, as we call it. So basically, these people often have a background in ethnography and they look out for the solutions that are already out there uh, for given uh, development challenges or look for what problems people try to solve uh, that we might not have on our radar yet because these solutions often signal uh, a certain need. Uh, there's a head of exploration often a background in uh, foresight futures uh, or data and uh, we had have a head of experimentation. And um, so, and it's, it's basically what we try to do with these roles is to make, it's, it's about new ways of meaning making, new ways of learning about the world, uh, how it works uh, and, and where we might uh, intervene uh, to accelerate what's already happening uh, because often you can better build on that than start something entirely new. Um, so, very briefly about, let's say, what I would call the building blocks, um, kind of um, the, some principles that the labs were built on. Um, so 
there is a, a shared purpose we have for all the labs for the entire network uh, that is to accelerate uh, on the SDGs. Uh, and what's interesting is that when people joined, uh, I mean, everyone is kind of like a world citizen uh, assigned to that, but it's, um, the other thing is also what we notice is that people not only, this is not a, about your world citizenship uh, and how you contribute uh, to these SDGs, but often also people uh, joined uh, the Accelerator Lab network because they felt uh, they wanted to contribute to their local communities uh, as well. Uh, and in some cases actually rebuild uh, their country. So there was a very strong sense of, uh, of shared purpose um, and that's also something that we uh, discussed uh, when we ran the boot camps uh, with uh, with the cohort. So there's a bit of an onboarding program uh, we ran, which also turned out to be quite crucial. Uh, also, the labs are given uh, a, quite a, 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 an open mandate. Uh, they have permission to explore and engage in experiment uh, outside the normal project portfolio uh, of a country office. Uh, and it's actually to uh, to explore and see new things uh, in a way uh, and build new partnerships. Um, uh, and what we often also see is that um, it, it having that kind of free ranging mandate uh, also allows them to uh, to work across uh, silos and in some cases even actually uh, around borders. Uh, for example, if you take cross uh, border trading uh, in, in in Africa. Um, I already mentioned that we recruited three roles for the labs, uh, bringing these um, kind of innovation or technical skills to the table, ethnography, data, foresight, and experimentation. Uh, but within, even within, let's say, these kind of four categories, uh, there's, there's quite a uh, bit of variety as well. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, these kind of new mindsets uh, enabled other things to happen uh, at UNDP as well. Uh, the digital work that uh, our chief digital office is, uh, uh, is working on and uh, Giulio Quaggiotto, uh, that name might ring a bell. Um, he, he's running the strategic innovation unit uh, and also kind of that works well in symbiosis with uh, the accelerator labs, the work that he's doing. The labs do have uh, some resources some, some money uh, that uh, I would say they can play with. Um, but of course they invest that in, um, in things that help them learn uh, about opportunities or development challenges. So um, for example, the team in Vietnam, um, they work with uh, the local government in Da Nang, um, the, the, the local, um, uh, there was a waste management uh, problem. Um, so it, it, there was basically the, um, uh, no more waste could be stored. And uh, so they had to reduce that in some way. And they ran a very small experiment uh, with asking, and it was basically just one uh, apartment block uh, to separate their waste. So it's a very small experiment where they started with, and it only cost a few thousand uh, dollars. So it was not that expensive. But what's interesting is that uh, that 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 very small experiment to let led to something bigger, uh, and that's kind of what we see with these small experiments uh, where they kind of often start. So they learned actually that uh, separating waste, the experiment failed in a way uh, because the formal waste system did not work as uh, as hoped for. Uh, so the, the waste was not picked up. So people stopped separating uh, their waste because the waste bins were overflowing. And once they realized that, they started looking at the formal waste system, uh, but also saw that there was a big informal waste system. And when they started exploring that informal waste system, what they learned is actually that these informal waste pickers almost kind of invented uh, what we would call a circular economy. Uh, but they were not kind of aware of that, um, which eventually led actually to building on that idea and how that was done, uh, that they're now running uh, uh, an, an inf uh, a circular uh, 
uh, circular economy lab. So it's kind of it's a few big steps, but it's a, thousands of smaller steps in between. Um, but just to signal that what might start with a very small intervention and even something that might fail, uh, it, it helped the labs, and that's also what we see across the labs, learn more about uh, the bigger system uh, and explore that system. Uh, and of course, we do have uh, an infrastructure. Uh, we have platforms, tools, uh, quite a few of them, which we will share very briefly, uh, that help us become uh, smarter uh, together. So, um, and as I already said, this that the labs do have a remit to to explore kind of uh, almost kind of beyond uh, the strategic plans of the office and which often kind of feeds into uh, a new strategic cycle. Um, but one of the things that, um, uh, I mean, this is basically, the, this is the old strategy or still the current strategy. Uh, UNDP just uh, launched the new strategy that starts the 1st of uh, 2022, 1st of January. Um, and that's organized around what we call signature solutions. Um, but also what happens, and there are six of them, poverty, governance, resilience, environment, energy, and gender. Um, and although this is a really kind of powerful framework uh, to see these development challenges in a specific way, um, it also means that certain things we do not see anymore. And because the labs kind of almost um, work beyond this, this remit, uh, but it often kind of touches on it in some way, uh, it allows them to see new challenges or new opportunities or actually work at, their intersec uh, at the intersection of uh, some of these uh, signature uh, solutions. But there is a bigger question is how we can actually learn not so much about these uh, signature solution areas, but how can we learn about things that are going on uh, in a country or in a, uh, in a region uh, real time? So this is not so much about let's kind of analyze uh, 10 years of data and then project into the future uh, what that might look like, um, but kind of get a real sense of what's happening right now, in, uh, especially uh, in, uh, in the communities. So it's kind of, we all kind of operate uh, in between uh, the cracks of all these kind of um, um, of these silos. So what, what kind of makes it work uh, in a way, and we can probably talk for hours about it, um, but it's, uh, in, in my view, a network uh, is about a group of people that are connected or feel connected uh, and work together uh, to achieve a certain uh, or a common goal. So it's about actors, it's about people, it's about their connections, uh, it's about the things they do together to achieve something. Uh, and one of the things we actually found is that um, what turned out to be crucial uh, in, uh, in bringing the lab network to life uh, is the kind of rhythm uh, we set for learning. Uh, so there is a whole bunch of activities uh, that are going on. Uh, some are initiated by us as uh, the global team, uh, but also quite a lot are initiated by, uh, or actually more, <laughs> are initiated by uh, the labs themselves. Um, so in these activities almost kind of serve three purposes. Uh, it's to strengthen connections. It might be about advancing uh, practice. Uh, but there's one that I would like to point out uh, and that's kind of central to the learning we do as a network and as well as what the labs do uh, individually uh, is how things get organized around certain uh, learning questions or challenges uh, that we see. So one of the things, uh, and going back to the idea of accelerations, what we try to do is to accelerate that learning, as I said. Um, and how we did that from the beginning uh, dictate that pace almost, um, but it became a little bit more free freestyle afterwards uh, by having a learning cycle of 100 days. So basically what labs are asked to do 
is every 100 days, they submit or revise uh, their learning plan of what they are hoping to learn about these uh, ecosystems around a certain development challenge in roughly about 100 days. Um, and, and that's something uh, important to, to bear in mind um, because having these fairly short learning cycles, uh, it does not kind of answer all the big learning questions, but at least it gives us a much better sense, uh, real time, of what the labs are learning. So one of the things we also ask the labs to do is to write monthly blogs. Uh, it's often kind of more like bi-monthly, uh, but to report on their learnings. Uh, and we also ask them to, uh, on a weekly basis, uh, to reflect on what they're learning. So where their monthly blogs are in a tradition of working out loud, so they're kind of outward facing, uh, sometimes they're a little bit polished, um, so it's not that kind of rough as you get with uh, the weekly reflections. Uh, but still, there's hundreds of blogs out there of work that the labs are doing and the things that they're learning. Uh, I will plonk a link uh, in the chat as well later when I have the opportunity. Um, but it kind of also tells us something about what's happening right now. So this is not, not so much we initiate a project and at the end of the project, after two years, we will write a report uh, and that's kind of where we share the learnings. It's kind of do that throughout this process. Uh, and so, also we have, um, we have our weekly drop-in calls. Uh, it was actually something that we started to support the recruitment process because we had a lot of people we, need, we needed to get on the same page, the, the people were doing the recruitment of the, uh, of the labs. Uh, and that almost kind of naturally in, evolved into, uh, because the rhythm was set up of having the, the weekly drop-in calls. Uh, and this is now kind of a moment where the lab, the network comes together every week on the Tuesday. Uh, and we might have invited guests like yesterday we had Toby. Um, and Jesper was also one of our guests and James uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, but it's, it might also be a moment where we share work, uh, where the lab share their work, uh, or where we feedback, uh, ref feedback the kind of patterns we see. So like with the quarterly uh, action plans or learning plans, we ask the labs to submit. Uh, we usually kind of feedback kind of, all right. So the, here are the kind of patterns we see uh, that the labs uh, are working on. So it's almost kind of like the learning questions in that sense are a, a magnet uh, that kind of attracts all these kind of activities uh, and, and learnings and helps us actually see in real time, uh, almost real time, uh, what uh, what the labs uh, are learning. Um, so Gina, um, over to you for uh, how we moved from a network of labs to a network of learning. Sure, thanks, Boss. I mean, maybe just we pause for a second here to see um, if there are any questions um, so far, reactions, um, you know, anything you want to share. We do have. Um, we've got a lot going on in the chat in terms of where people are um, dialing in from, from Uruguay to Alberta, Canada, to upstate New York, to Berlin, Brazil. Um, we've got quite a few Algeria, um, so it's the Chicago Public Library. So, um, so it's great to see colleagues here. We do have one question, which is a tough question. So I don't know um, if we want to answer it now or later, <laughs> but um, from, from Lindsay. Um, which is basically, um, you know, uh, responding to the, the, what we're saying about accelerating the pace of learning. And the question is, you know, are we doing that? Um, and how can we tell? Um, so I don't know if you want to kind of give that one a think, um, boss, and then we come back to it uh, later, or you want to, if you want to take it now, I can also reflect on it as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, you, you can do a very brief response. <laughs> I mean, this kind of a bit of a question you had in the beginning. How do we measure actually how fast we're learning? <laughs> I don't think we have tackled that question, but you want to give it a go, uh, Gina? Sure. I mean, just to say, I think when we started this, you know, exactly, you know, basically our PR people came up with this idea that we would be the world's largest and fastest learning network on sustainable development, which was brilliant. Um, and so then we said, okay, so how do we show that we're the fastest? 
and we had to figure out how fast we're learning now. The closest we could come in our organization was by looking at the program cycle, which is largely set up by five-year plans and annual reflections. So the closest we could come to how fast the mainframe of the organization learns is once a year, right? Obviously that's not true. Obviously people are learning all the time, um, but that was kind of what we got. So shrinking this to hundred day cycles as boss is talking about is, you know, is a, a step forward um, in that. I think more than, more than speed, what I find is we're, we're sort of revealing, it's not great news, but we're revealing in a way new aspects of the problem um, that, that we're, we were unaware of before, or new aspects of opportunities in terms of grassroots innovations, community practices, you know, um, kind of um, uneven, unevenly distributed uh, promising ideas and, and solutions that are out there that no one knew about before, right? So in a way, it, it is about speed, um, but it's also about revealing this other, seeing this set of innovations and possibilities that no one saw before um, in the first place. There are some other questions here. Um, yeah, Kyle, uh, Sayo, it's, uh, I mean, I'll talk more about that uh, when I talk about kind of the principles, how we build uh, the learning network, but it's in, in very short, it's that there is something about how to create a psychological safe space. Uh, and that I think was also one of the big challenges uh, we had. Yeah. Um, but I'll talk more about that. In a minute. Okay. Yeah. All right. So maybe I'll just charge on and you have a look at the questions and then we can, we can, um, we can kind of bring them in yeah. as we go. These are really good questions. Um, very good questions. I'm getting distracted by them. Anyway, okay, so what I'll talk about now is basically what we're building in terms of a prototype, right? So we're calling it, you know, we're trying to deliver on this promise to be a learning network. And, you know, by the way, fast <laughs> in so doing, we see this as research and development in action in two ways. It's both kind of expanding how we learn and how we approach knowledge management. Um, and also we're devoting it to a topic which we think is at the edge of the knowledge of the organization, but very central to achieving its goals. Um, so I'll talk a little bit how we're trying to use this network learning prototype to move from being a network of 91 labs around the world to an actual learning network um, where computational science comes in. And then at the end, we'll close out with how we're trying to frame this as continuous renewal um, continuous research and development. You can go ahead, boss. Um, so, so just to, to kind of frame um, our own learning and progress and our own ignorance, um, I really like this quote, which um, uh, Donella Meadows put in um, Thinking in Systems, a primer um, from Wendell Berry, where he says, the acquisition of knowledge always involves the revelation of ignorance. It almost is the revelation of ignorance. So it's like that moment when you realize how little you know, and this is kind of what I was referring to, Lindsay, um, that's when you're actually creating knowledge, right? Once you start to, um, once you start to see that limitation and all the other things that you don't know, that's when the knowledge is happening. And this is really uh, just to say that that makes me very confident that we are indeed, you know, acquiring knowledge because we're very aware of our own ignorance the more we go into this kind of work. So just a, a moment on the why. I mean, Boss touched on this, but just to, to reframe it a little bit, um, essentially the kinds of problems that we're dealing with today, that's our hypothesis. Um, you can go ahead, Boss. Um, uh, basically, do not have best practices. There's no country, um, we saw this from you know, Glasgow last week, right? There's no country taking all of the actions needed to avert uh, a higher uh, planetary warming than 1.5 degrees Celsius. Nobody's got it, right? And so what is needed is not this model of replicating best practices and copying pasting around the world, but rather empowering experimentation and kind of speeding up the pace of learning. 
we also kind of look at knowledge management and we feel like it's got to be reinvented, right? This idea that you can sit at the, you know, at the headquarters of an organization and dictate down what knowledge should be created um, and how it should be managed is way out of touch. Um, we also find that anytime you set uh, predefined categories, um, they block your vision, as Boss was saying. So of course we have a strategic plan that says we're going to connect 500 people to sustainable, 500 million people to sustainable energy access in five years, right? If we start hyper focusing on that, we miss, you know, what we would be seeing um, the categories that happen in between the small scale solar that's starting to happen, the solutions that people create on the margins that actually could help us achieve that goal. Um, so, so it's really important kind of to move beyond those predefined taxonomies because they can be helpful for like target setting, but they can also block your vision. We also know that the best knowledge is tacit and it sits in people's heads and it lives in context, which means that this action that we're all hoping to do where you sort of pull out the heuristic which applies uh, transnationally or across context is extraordinarily difficult. Um, and you have to be careful how you do it. Um, and finally, you know, in a nod to, to, to Dave Snowden, and of course this famous report that came out many years ago from the World Bank where they looked at how many of their uh, reports are actually even downloaded and they got to like less than a third. Um, if you're focusing only on kind of the stocks of knowledge and not how it flows and where it flows, um, you're, you're not gonna be making much impact because um, you know, a lot of people don't read those 300 page reports that we produce. Shocking breaking news there. So in terms of what we have here, we scratching out building because it's more like stewarding and it's actually more like following. One of the first things we did is we sat back and we tried to figure out, okay, we've got this network of 91 labs, what kind of knowledge are they producing, right? And so we categorized these, um, you can go ahead, boss. Uh, we categorized kind of what kind of knowledge uh, these labs are creating, right? And this is really a distillation because it doesn't even cover it, but we wanted to hyper-focus um, our, our efforts so that we could expand the frontier of knowledge. So starting up here at the top um, at 12 o'clock here, basically they're learning how to do innovation, right? Um, you have labs that are issuing innovation challenges, you know, around prosthetics in the Gambia um, and around a range of issues, you know, in different countries, we're getting a sense how you organize an innovation challenge, how you do that within our procedural rules in the organization and how you uh, do that to meet actual demand rather than just fueling it with great ideas and, and, and supply. Moving around here in the green circle, we also think we're creating knowledge about the weak signals of change, right? This accelerated pace in the environment, what's happening to the future of work because of COVID, that sort of thing. We're, we're creating that kind of knowledge. We are a sensory network as well. We're also doing experiments. So as Boss said, you know, Vietnam and other countries do simple experiments on how to get people to separate their garbage. There are results of those experiments. And the idea is, as we get better at this, that one lab should be able to pick up um, at least some pointers from where another lab left off. And lastly, we double down heavily on uh, people's knowledge, the knowledge of women and men who are facing the effects of climate change you know, on their farms, et cetera. What do they know and, and what can we learn from that? Um, so again, one of the things we started to see, see in um, Sudan recently was the growth of this kind of small scale solar devices, right? People who just have makeshift solar panels that then they set up um, you know, a stall to char charge people to charge their cell phones. So they make little money to charge their cell phones based on the solar energy, which is a free asset. And our head of solutions mapping there, Basma, uh, started noticing this happening more and more. What we try to do then is take that and apply it to our energy program, which might have started with a frame of thinking, okay, we've got to connect 10 million people in Sudan to energy access you know, in the next five years. Let's think big, let's think grid. They might've been missing these smaller scale solar solutions, which are a little bit messy, a little bit unconnected, but that's the kind of knowledge that we're creating.
So the next thing we did after we sat back and said, okay, what kind of knowledge are we sitting on here? Then we, um, we tried to define a workflow, right? And to say, okay, this is a highly distributed kind of intelligence. You've got 91 teams embedded in the United Nations working on a range of topics. It changes every hundred days and they're kind of approaching it however they see best. Um, so pulling from that a thread uh, requires you to have a workflow. Basically, what, as Boss said, we ask uh, the labs to reflect publicly in free text form. We're kind of moving into audio, but slowly. Um, we then have a little bit of kind of advanced search techniques um, where the machines helped us find the leads for where to look for information. Um, then the humans get back in the game and try and read what we find for patterns and pick up these results of experiments, the ethnographic insights, the weak signals of change. We organize around learning questions. Um, we convene in learning circles around specific, almost research questions, uh, but action learning questions. And then ideally, and this is where you know we're still learning, we try and blend our experiential knowledge, the knowledge we gain from exploration, experimentation on a small scale, to what is known empirically um, in academia, in uh, you know research hubs, etc. So that's our sort of flow that we've set up. One of the things that we, so what we're learning about right now, we've set a priority uh, to learn about something that we saw bubbling up through the network. Um, and, you know, labs were coming at it in various ways. Basically, you know, it's, I think the ILO tells us that six out of 10 workers globally are working in informal settings. Um, so this means that they may have a business that's not registered, um, and we've seen this kind of, it, it, it was sort of assumed it would go away as uh, gross domestic product rises. It doesn't seem to be doing that. Um, and in the context of the pandemic, it's also increased because people need different ways of, of making an income. Um, so we started to get this slow hunch that, wait a minute, okay, if you know we're working in countries in Africa where 60, 70, 80, 90% of the economy is so-called informal economy, it's the economy, it's not a sideshow. Um, and, and what are we as an organization, you know, how are we approaching that, right? Naturally, our default is to say, those people deserve social protection benefits, they shouldn't be working in unsafe conditions, but in order to do that, they have to be registered. Um, the government has to see them. So we felt like, hey, this is an area where um, it's affecting a lot of what we do. It affects, you know, circular economy work, as Boss said, because so much of waste management systems are, are informal or semi-informal. It in affected COVID-19 uh, response because social so solidarity networks were faster than, you know, delivery of cash assistance. We're missing this whole thing because, because states can't see it. So we started to focus on this. We set out six learning questions on it. Right now we're focusing on a particular one, um, which is uh, what does going digital mean for informal economies? So one of the things we've seen is a lot of these uh, informal markets, informal vendors are kind of leapfrogging um, into the digital age, getting on um, e-commerce platforms um, that give them access to markets, um, uh, even in the context when there are heavy lockdowns um, and people can't make it to market. So we're trying to understand the implications of this, the drivers of this, uh, what exactly is happening here? Wh who's managing the digital exhaust from all of these e-commerce platforms, which have kind of exploded um, to what we can see um, in the context of the pandemic. So this is where kind of the computational science bit comes in. Um, one of the things that we noticed early on when um, we convened the very first uh, boot camps that we did when we used to do them in person uh, back in the day um, was that um, our lab team from Mexico, um, they, came, they were the unlucky souls who came to the very first boot camp where, you know, things were a little shaky. And um, they left a, a, a lovely note on the way out um, in the room because they knew others would be coming into the same room for the, for the boot camp, for the onboarding. And they said, you know, Boss and Jane are great, <laughs> but they don't know everything. If you're, you know, a head of exploration, join this WhatsApp group. If you're a head of experimentation, join this WhatsApp group. Um, and and these, uh, these channels actually grew up to be 
the most lively exchange of learning. So what uh, we, we did, you can go ahead, boss, um, was basically um, you can sort of, you know, WhatsApp chats are, are downloadable and we can, um, we can basically start to see, um, make sense of that chatter, which is very much organic and demand driven, right? It's, hey, has anyone ever done a hackathon, you know, on this topic? How do you, how do you do it? Oh, well, I did it on this. Let me tell you that, right? And what we started to see was we're almost at 300 messages flying around a day. We have, you know, countries, the lab teams in Paraguay being very active with, for example, Uganda. And this is also where building a simple search tool, we can search the WhatsApp chats uh, to find out what they're, what they're actually uh, talking about. Um, so we can go directionally, we can kind of sit back and observe, and that's where we started to see the focus on informal economies um, as creeping across whatever the labs were working on. Uh, but we can also go in and dive in and use it as a knowledge management tool. I think the important thing about, go ahead, boss, is um, the important thing about this sort of data scraping method is we're really, really trying not to ask for reports of what people are doing or not to commission from the top down requests to fill our taxonomy and our vision. We're rather using these sort of search tools to make sense of all this distributed knowledge and chatter that happens organically. And then from that, we can start to steward and guide and curate and codify. So what basically we, we find interesting things happen where it was easier for us to get access to the WhatsApp data than the data on Microsoft Teams. Um, but we've got many different sort of sources of these. Um, and what it helps us find is not what the answer to our learning question is, for example, what does going digital mean for uh, the informal economy, but who has that knowledge and why they have it, why they want it, who's responding to them, um, you know, who's active in the network. It's the who question that helps us focus on the knowledge flow, not so much uh, the knowledge stock. So just a couple of reflections on what we're learning about learning um, before I hand back over to Boss. The first one should have probably been obvious, but um, as much as um, it's exciting to tap into, for example, WhatsApp conversations, um, and as much as we were transparent about this with our lab network, um, you know, it was very clear that no matter how many times we talked about this, there was nervousness and concern about sort of big brothers watching kind of dynamic going on there. So what we've done is set up a data governance framework where people can opt in or out of this. Um, we wanted not to give up on it despite the resistance because it is where the network is alive. And it, it makes our network a little bit different in the sense that we're not um, extracting people to take part in consultations. We're not sort of like forcing them and emailing them and, hey, we're doing this consultation and would you join? It just happens. Um, so because it's organic, we wanted to tap into it and govern it wisely. The other challenge we're having, um, we kind of frame as the battle of epistemologies, right? So as Boss said, we've hired a lot of um, ethnographers, sociologists, people who our organization doesn't normally employ. Um, and they create a different kind of evidence, right? Um, on the plus side, so they bring this sort of anecdotal, ethnographic, a little bit um, uh, less, it's not hard in fact, uh, data, statistics, projections, trends. Um, we start to see a little bit of the organization realizing that the policy fail some of the policy failures we're seeing in global development may be due to missing out on that kind of knowledge. Um, we see this a lot in Africa, in the Sahel. Um, we see it in, as Boss was talking about, the kind of cross-border trade where um, there's a big push to uh, promote more inter-African trade on the continent. Um, and those, those small pieces of information like the fact that borders are closed doesn't mean that goods and services aren't transporting over borders, it just means that there's a higher toll to pay um, when you try and cross a border. Um, so these kinds of things are actually finding their way into our development programming. 
still, it's not perfect. Um, we still face resistance um, and we get this sort of, you know, here you guys were supposed to be the innovation, you know, gurus. And we thought you'd give us this sort of big, you know, reinvent gravity kind of thing. And you're giving me, uh, you know, a small scale um, solution, these low tech hacks, uh, some kind of traditional knowledge that we don't know what to do with, or, or these micro trends of cross border trade. Um, it, it's still challenging to get that recognized as evidence and acted upon in the organization. And the third thing I think we've learned is as much as um, we believe in focusing on connecting people, not collecting knowledge, you do need to articulate the deliverables of all of this connecting and chatter, right? So this diagram sometimes speaks to people, sometimes doesn't. But essentially what we're trying to say here is we see knowledge emerging, we're trying to capture it, and we're trying to spread it. We're also trying to transition from this uncodified tacit knowledge um, that's kind of hard to pin down, hard to substantiate, and elevate that into codified and explicit knowledge, which would get to the point where, for example, we could have a policy paper on uh, what going digital means for informal economies, right? How should data from e-commerce platforms that are connecting informal vendors to market be governed, right? This is kind of where we would like to be going. Um, and we promised here in the promo, we would talk about what was hard to do and what we haven't yet done. It is hard to connect this back to, to practice of the organization, exactly because you're bringing up uh, categories of knowledge that, that are not on the radar, right? So it's when you come and you're like, oh my God, what's going on with informality? You take it back to the organization and it's like, is that the environmental team that we should be talking to? Is it the poverty team? Um, is it the governance team? You know, who's, who, who's gonna be excited about this knowledge and ready to like, you know, take it up? Um, that's challenging. So this is go of, here? Yeah, or, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, or shall we kind of take a minute? Uh, I mean, we've got f just only a few more slides left, but it's um, there are a few questions uh, in the chat. Maybe we should take some questions. What do you think? And some actually, I think, relate to uh, some of the things that you said. I would also want to make a quick comment on uh, on, on this final, uh, of not this final, but it, this, uh, this diagram here. Um, it's as Gina said, it's kind of what we basically try to do is to this prototype that we're building of uh, network learning. Um, and it's actually uh, the, quite a few things that we've been doing and trying uh, over the past two years. But um, I remember we had a, a conversation uh, with the team on a Friday about half a year ago. And we're discussing this and it's uh, this diagram almost kind of emerged from that conversation and for me that was pretty much like the embodiment of what the prototype uh, actually looks like um so as you can see this is as these whole different uh just these different sources it taps into and um some of it is kind of very technology driven but some of it is very conversational driven uh like uh, the learning circles uh, that's basically where we gather people together around a very specific uh, learning question and just kind of almost see what bubbles up from these conversations. Uh, but the point I want to make is that um, this prototype is not static. Uh, it's almost like a perpetual prototype. Uh, and if there is one question on what we're learning, uh, the other question is also how we're learning. Um, and I believe that's kind of something that evolves and, and keeps evolving. Uh, so I think if you ask us in, in about six or 12 months time, uh, then this diagram, uh, hopefully, uh, but I guess it will uh, look slightly different uh, from what it is. So uh, let me kind of quickly take two questions. Uh, one is from Cindy on uh, whether, uh, let's say, uh, producing this content and text. So I assume you're talking about uh, the blogs we asked the, the labs to write. Uh, whether that's uh, considered as a burden. Um, I mean, uh, the labs can respond to that as well, uh, the labs who are here in the call. 
Um, but it's also back to how this was designed or how we thought about it in the early days. What we, um, I mean, this is not like you do a project and then after two years, you kind of write a report uh, about the things that you learned. Uh, and sometimes these reports are a little bit polished as well because the actual learnings uh, are too painful to report that back to a donor uh, about the things that didn't work. Um, so, and that's kind of not what we wanted to happen. Uh, and again, this idea of kind of having doing that real time. Uh, and we do see that uh, some labs are struggling a little bit with it. Uh, I mean, writing is, is kind of like a skill uh, itself. Uh, but we also have some really, really, really great blogs. Uh, Nadia uh, actually wrote a really, really good one. Uh, Nadia, perhaps you can plunk the link in uh, in a chat at some time. Um, so yeah, it's it's um, probably some see it as a burden, but I think the benefit is also it helps us actually see what what everyone is doing, and it's not just us at the global team. Uh, it's also uh, the other labs who can see. Uh, what other labs are working on, as well as uh, our donors, uh, as well as uh, senior management. Uh, we know that uh, Akim, the administrator, uh, is reading these blogs as well, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, so yeah, so it, it, it cuts in many, uh, many different uh, ways. Um, I think um, there was another, another question from Elena on integration of the labs. Uh, let me kind of see, you mentioned mandate and capabilities, which are important in building the network, but how do you make sure that the labs are well integrated within the office? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I think that's certainly also one of the challenges uh, that we see. Um, there are multiple sides to this, uh, to this challenge. First one is probably also that there is an issue or there's a challenge with skill. Uh, we as we have 91 labs and we as a global team are fairly small, uh, that means that we cannot always kind of provide individual uh, support to that. Um, so that's kind of one of the challenges we have, but it's uh, things we did like, uh, we see that uh, senior management, so each country office uh, has what they call uh, a res rep, resident representative, who's kind of, let's say the director of uh, that country office uh, and they play a key role in get, uh, positioning the labs within uh, the work of the country office uh, as well as giving that mandate and um, as i already said it's we are a largely decentralized organization the real work happens in the countries um, but we also have a, a, a it's it's very broad. It's very varied uh, how these labs, of, uh, sorry, how the country offices uh, are managed, uh, and there are uh, res reps who immediately saw the potential uh, of the labs and ran with it. Um, there are the, the, there is a group uh, who you might call them fan sitters, but kind of first wanted to see things <laughs> before they actually started to support in a way. Um, but I think it's also because this has been done large scale um, and, and for kind of a couple of years now, uh, some of the, the value is being demonstrated, not in a first month, not in a second month, but maybe after a year and after two years. So giving it some time uh, also helped to bring some of the fan sitters uh, to, um, to the side of the uh, the ambassadors uh, and the advocates. Uh, but I also acknowledge that there are country offices where that management support is uh, is lacking. And, and that's kind of where things uh, are, are tough uh, in, in a way. We, we do have conversations with uh, senior management uh, and we try to get them enthusiastic uh, about it. Uh, but yeah, that, that sometimes they do not prioritize uh, that. Um, there is another thing, it's also briefly in hindsight, uh, I think one of the things that we did, we recruited very specifically for, uh, for let's say, innovation skills, ethnographic uh, skills, um, um, experiment, uh, experimentation, 
data, foresight. Um, but there is also, um, and I think that's one of the things that we overlooked when, when we were rushed to to put out the uh, uh, the job descriptions, um, is that advocacy skills uh, turned out to be uh, incredibly uh, important. Uh, but we've also noticed that this kind of these are the skills that also, uh, I mean, many labs develop them. Uh, while they started, it's it's uh, it's often kind of people who have been running a lab uh, will bring these skills uh, to to the table uh, already. So that's kind of a quick few uh, answers that also kind of uh, refers a little bit to what Gina was saying. Uh, let me kind of uh, go to the last bit, uh, which is kind of, uh, and this is where I, I mean the title of this festival is called Work in Progress. Uh, so this is kind of the work that we have been doing, and this is kind of where we uh, currently are. Uh, it would also be great to get some of your thoughts uh, on this as well. So the first thing is, uh, I mean, you might kind of say this this has to do with taking it forward. Um, and this might also be probably relevant for some of you, especially if you are thinking about uh, building or kickstarting a learning network yourself. It does not necessarily need to happen uh, on a global scale uh, as we are doing. Uh, I mean, that can be very local. Uh, it can be uh, national uh, or perhaps um, a across a number of countries. I see that as well happening uh, in, in, in some cases. Um, and I think the way we worked uh, or have been working uh, over the past two years or three years almost is uh, this is not like we have we we had a plan clearly cut out and we just stick to the plan uh, a lot of this you might know the expression uh, crossing the river while feeling for the stone that's kind of of how this kind of process uh, how it felt uh, it's kind of trying out stuff see what works uh, move on so um so where we initially kind of were asked to, to build a learning network, we have that learning network now, uh, and it, it, it's up and running. Um, so, um, and, and the question is also, uh, how do we move, uh, move from here? It's, uh, it was actually also uh, JD, uh, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, who asked me, so if we were to do this again, uh, then how can we almost kind of replicate this? Um, I don't believe in replication in terms of like, here is a, a recipe. Uh, and if you follow that recipe, then you will certainly have a, a learning network. Uh, it's a lot messier than that. Uh, because basically it's kind of like a social network um, and people are not always that predictable. Um, so it's kind of dealing and working uh, with that. And um, so the success we have achieved so far is most of that can be attributed, I guess, to uh, to um, to the curation uh, of the network. And I think that's also where the hard part of this kind of building the network or curating the network, uh, whatever you might call it, um, that makes it a little bit hard to grasp uh, sometime. Uh, but instead of kind of coming up with a recipe, because that question that JD asked me, um, I kind of thought that there must be some sort of principles uh, underpinning uh, our work. And interestingly, I, I think if you look at uh, when I kind of started to write this down, um, I learned that a lot of this knowledge is in different forms is already there. I kind of found stuff around learning ecologies. I think it was referred to in the old systems thinking uh, literature uh, and a kind of quite a few other things that, uh, that kind of show that there are based on similar principles. So I won't go to all these principles uh, in, in detail, uh, but uh, broadly speaking, uh, there are four categories. Uh, there is something about the curation we do. Uh, there is something about what we mobilize and how we do that. Uh, there is something about the sensing and positioning, uh, and there is also something about uh, leadership. Um, let me start, and it's kind of the bottom uh, corner uh, about leadership. Uh, and I find leadership always kind of a bit of a tricky word, and just like innovation and strategy, it's often kind of overused. 
Um, but it's, um, I think, leadership in, in how me, Gina, and our colleagues, it's, it's largely more kind of distributed leadership, uh, how, it, how, it, how we started. Um, it's, it's kind of starting from a humble position. Um, it's, uh, this is not like things you can uh, tell a network to do top down uh, that simply doesn't work. Um, and I think it's also about acknowledging about the things we do not know. Uh, what Gina just said uh, is uh, when we ran the first boot camp, we had the labs who joined us and very eager to do stuff, but uh, and hoping that we had all the answers, but obviously we did not have the answers. Uh, and where we actually had to say, we don't know, we do not have the answers to these questions, but we can learn about this together. So it's this, this, this humbleness is also about um, putting yourself in a very fragile position for some leaders. Uh, I'm fairly comfortable with that, but um, I acknowledge that there is also in the public space, people rather not kind of confess that they do not have the answer. Uh, but I see that as a prompt for, um, for collective learning. I already mentioned the mandate uh, that the labs have, uh, and we were very explicit right from the beginning uh, saying there are a couple of things that you must do. <laughs> and that's learning about these development challenges. There are also a few things you cannot do. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's just red lines, uh, like commit fraud, uh, breach uh, ethical code, uh, and a few of these other things. But in between this kind of the things, the, the very basic things that they must do, uh, accelerate that learning and the things they must not do, uh, there is a big space. Uh, and that's kind of what we left open largely uh, for the labs, also with this idea of uh, let a thousand flowers bloom. And as Gina has already kind of illustrated in, in how we use uh, technology in a way, but also our sometimes our gut feeling a little bit, is to kind of see where the network is. Uh, we follow the network. Uh, it's, it's the network itself is really hard to direct in that sense. And it actually brings me to my uh, second point. In one way of kind of um, I wouldn't say directing, but stewarding uh, the network is by feeding back what the network is actually doing uh, and what is it, uh, what it is learning. So this is not so much about uh, what's kind of described in collective intelligence design is uh, data extraction. Uh, what we try to do is to empower people uh, with uh, what, or empower the network uh, by what it's doing. Uh, and as you might have guessed, as uh, we are a largely distributed network of 91 labs, uh, the real learning happens at the edges uh, of, uh, of the network. Uh, and so the question is, how do we bring that uh, learning back uh, to the core and to the, uh, to the network uh, itself? And that's kind of where these learning questions are really, really crucial and organize that energy uh, around uh, these learning questions as I've illustrated uh, earlier. Um, so, and this is, um, I, I think the point, next point is also uh, to what Kyle, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, uh, about uh, how do you, um, how do you, let's say, enable or kind of stimulate people to share their learnings, uh, and even if there are failures. Um, this is very much about the psychological safe space. Uh, and Amy Edmondson wrote some, some good work on that as well. Um, but the fact that it's written down uh, what it is and how you might do it doesn't mean it's easy actually to build a psychological safe space. Uh, and it also does not happen uh, overnight. And it's, it's something that you have to nurture uh, and, and work on continuously. Uh, but it was a very deliberate choice uh, when we ran the boot camp. So this is kind of like an onboarding program uh, that uh, every lab basically went through, which is one week uh, when we did it face to face and about one month uh, when we did it uh, remotely. Um, but building some, some very simple habits um, to, to create that safe space uh, is what we started literally doing from day one. 
Uh, and it can be a very simple exercise, like what we call an EQ check-in. So how are you feeling? Um, how are you feeling today? And, and share these kind of things, and that kind of creates the conditions uh, for that uh, psychological safe space to happen. There's a lot more to that as well. Uh, also, uh, the team from Mexico uh, did some experiments with uh, the format of Fokok Nights. Uh, um, I think quite a bit of a revolution to do that within uh, the UN system. Uh, but in a way, that, that worked really, really well. So and as I already mentioned, this um, having a rhythm and rituals uh, is, is really, really crucial uh, in building uh, uh, that learning network. So I'm not saying that you, you must kind of have a weekly meeting. Uh, for us, that, that turns out that worked out naturally. It almost kind of, as I said, it, it went from having a weekly check-in with the recruiters. Uh, and when the labs were onboarded, uh, we kind of continued uh, that tradition or uh, a rhythm. Uh, and then we kind of also had a platform that we could use. So last point, I think it's, uh, and this is, uh, as this is work in progress, and I must confess, this, is, this looks incredibly polished. <laughs> Uh, but if I show you the this, this sketch, what I've been working on for the past couple of months and my notes, uh, that's incredibly messy. So I just, for this call, I took the opportunity to polish this a little bit more. Um, so there's also stuff that, I mean, it might look polished in this case, but it's it's still a uh, work in progress pretty much. So there's, there's, I think, also something about a principle about the purpose. And... And of course, we, we managed to kind of get a shared sense of purpose uh, across the network. Um, but I think uh, there is also a question, what is the purpose of all this learning? And in a way, it feels like what we're trying to do is that learning helps us to create new positions in the world. Uh, it helps us to allow the world in a new way. It allows us to engage with stakeholders that are out there uh, that UNDP was not engaging with. Uh, it allows us to, uh, let's say, engage with the system or uh, engage with complexity uh, in a different way as well. So hopefully this does not sound too abstract. And I mean, if you have questions, then uh, we can continue uh, the conversation uh, on that. Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Uh, let's keep this up and maybe there are a lot of really good questions in the chat and I know we've got just about 10 minutes left. So I was thinking maybe right. we could spend the rest of the time on, on, on Q and a. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, I'll take the first one. And then there are a lot of, um, I think people do want to know a bit more about creating a psychological safe space. Um, there's a question here from Priti specifically on those who have lived through trauma. Um, there's another question kind of more about the, the cultural shift and cha facilitating changes in behavior. So if you have a think about those, I'll take a couple other ones in the meantime, if that sounds okay. Um, oops, one second here, we've got somebody coming in. So yeah, sorry, I haven't been following the chat. Yeah, no uh, worries, no worries. Um, so, so maybe just to um, to pick up here, there, there's a good question here that James put in the chat. I'm not sure, um, sorry for the distraction. This is what we get for working from home. Um, so, so, um, so, um, so there's one question here. What is the main difference between this network um, and the perhaps existing, though maybe less formal network that might already exist in the organization? Um, the thinking of those people who seem to know everything that's going on in a department or organization. Um, so, so I think, uh, I'm not sure whose question this is because it came in from James, but, um, but or maybe it's James, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think the main difference, so basically we are a network of labs embedded inside a global organization of 17,000 people working in 170 countries. Um, so there are definitely knowledge networks existing in this organization. Um, what we're trying to do differently is this totally bottom-up approach, right? So we're not saying commissioning the labs in our network, you know, to work on circular economy or to work on informal economy or, you know, to figure out a solution to the plastics problem. They do what they want to do, how they want to do it. 
they reflect on it and then we try and capture what's what's coming up from that so it's it's kind of completely bottom up rather than rather than commissioning research according to organizational priorities which is usually kind of what happens right logically so right you have an organizational goal you want to know what what the organization knows about achieving that goal and you kind of commission it out so this bottom up um style and then what what boss talked about driving learning from the edge so instead of a traditional knowledge management strategy where we're trying to capture everything the organization knows we tried to identify what's the edge of our knowledge right and when we could find a question no one knew the answer to, like, what does going digital mean for the informal economy? That's where we start, right? That's where we like focus our energies. So that's kind of the main difference. Um, there's another question here on scale, but maybe boss, if you're ready with psychological safety, you can take that one and then I'll come back to the one on scale. I'm still processing it a little bit, sorry. Okay, you need a moment? Okay, I can go on, I'll go to scale then. Um, <laughs> psychological safety, not an easy one. Huh? <laughs> so, no, it's the, especially it's for, for <laughs> Preeti gave you a tough one. Um, so so Gaston has got a question here on um, kind of like, I like the way you framed it, where was it? Um, um, something here, how do you address the scale? Desire, curse, maybe both, um, I like that. Because um, I do think that thinking in terms of scale and constantly thinking in terms of scale can be a curse and can be uh, and can actually inhibit progress uh, because you miss the smaller, granular, uh, closer to the problem kind of knowledge. Um, so, but basically, in general, how we address scale is this: I mean, the labs were not designed to take things to scale; they were designed to explore new data sources, um, run experiments map grassroots innovations and learn from those um, and then to hand over to government to you know hubs to research institutions to others to scale that's sort of one level of the answer that doesn't always satisfy everyone because they think you've got this huge network and and why are you not taking things to scale what we've seen is that we try and think about um um scaling up scaling out and scaling deep um this is rydell and little um their work which is which is very useful so scaling out is what people normally think of you know replication more geographies you know more people using the app etc we don't see a lot of that kind of scale and actually what we're learning is that um is that that kind of replication where you're producing the same results in the same way, you know, several different times, it doesn't happen and it can't happen. What you actually happen is it's a diversity of approaches inspired by each other, right? And so scaling actually requires diversity in order to happen. It's not about uniformity and proving that this same thing, you know, uh, reached 500 million people. Um, so that's kind of one way we think about it. what we do see is scaling up, meaning impacting policy. So we see a lot of governments looking at us and saying, hey, you have one of these labs. Could we have a lab? How should we set up a lab? What should be in our innovation strategy and policy? And that's where we have an in to say, OK, this is my this might be how you would do it. And this is how we can influence policy, thereby creating the conditions for continuous innovation rather than handing over one innovation uh, for, for government to scale. Um, so it's an ongoing um, dialogue. It's not like we've solved it, um, but that's kind of how we're approaching it for now. Okay, boss, it's time for psychological yeah. safety. Yeah, 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 sorry. <laughs> no more time. <laughs> Here is the long answer to the tough question. Uh, no, I mean, it's a, it's a great question, but again, it's, um, it, it's not like, uh, here is a recipe and uh, uh, and it will work. Um, but I do think that in order to create that safe space, uh, the way you facilitate conversations, the way you facilitate convenings uh, is really important, uh, I guess. And uh, uh, one of the things I forgot to mention, but it's, it's we largely also build on the idea of collective intelligence design. So the idea of how can we become smart together? 
And one of those principles, it says that to, uh, to be inclusive and to cherish uh, diversity. Uh, so all the voices in a room uh, matter. And that's also how we try to facilitate uh, these conversations. They can be small. Uh, I mean, we can meet with a couple of people, but uh, the weekly calls, they usually are attended by 100, 150 people. Um, and, but it's, it, I mean, Gina and I, of course, and uh, uh, quite a few of our other colleagues, um, we had many conversations over the past two years uh, online, as well as uh, when we still had uh, the luxury of uh, meeting people uh, face to face. Um, I think we've always been uh, very open uh, about uh, discussing things and or if they are critiquing uh, a way of working or ideas or plans or whatever. So it's, and I think that has also helped to, um, to, to create that kind of learning culture or that kind of um, bit of, yeah, make, make that space open. But I think the other thing that also uh, helped us is that we always kind of put an emphasis on reflection um so where the labs are asked uh, every week to reflect that's one but uh, we run numerous kind of ways of how we uh, exercise as activities where we reflect on things uh, as, as well and i think that also kind of nurtures some sort of a, a culture of where that becomes almost like a habit uh, and i'm i'm conscious that in sometimes in bureaucracies reflection does not happen uh, or not kind of in a structured or deliberate uh, way uh, and i remember from work that i did uh, with, with various governments is when we ran uh, 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 reflection exercises that they said oh actually this is so great but we normally do not do this because i mean yeah if you this is not work right reflecting uh, which always kind of confused me a little bit how can you tackle really complex problems if you're not reflecting uh, uh, on yeah, what you're trying to do. I hope that answers your question uh, a, a little bit, but also related to that, I wanted to pick up on, I think it was one of the last questions from Pretty, uh, Pretty on uh, how do you create a sense of belonging, which is a tough one as well, <laughs> um, not an easy one. Uh, but I think... Um, Again, and it's what it says here, that onboarding the network, uh, and I uh, put it here in, in between quotes, but priming new members. Um, I felt that when, lab, when people or labs join the network, they need a moment where it's kind of like, now we're kind of part of this network. Uh, it's kind of a bit like, when a chicken comes out of the egg, it's the kind of the first thing the chicken see is like, uh, this is mother. Uh, so many, uh, many of the lab people believe that Gina is the mother of the network because that's the first person they saw. Um, but in a way, it's sense of belonging. I, it, I think we do that in many ways, but the most important one is that I think we are clear on the purpose. And this is also literally where we started almost the first activity of the bootcamp was discussing the purpose. So why are we are here, why we have to accelerate the lab networks, but also why, uh, let's say the people who are joining the network, why you're here, what are you bringing to the table? Uh, so it goes back to purpose. And this is pretty much about connecting with purpose. Uh, I think the other thing, and, um, and this is a bit of a personal note, but it's uh, the UN and UNDP can be, feel quite formal uh, in most cases and uh, or in quite a few cases. Uh, so, I mean, meetings are often run as kind of town hall uh, uh, gatherings. So there's a few people talking uh, to a lot of people. Uh, and I think what we try to do is also to kind of flatten that, that structure and that hierarchy and make it more open. Uh, but also, and it's almost kind of like by being playful, um, Add a little bit of fun and pleasure. Um, so we kind of really enjoy playing music before we uh, we run sessions. Uh, so there is always kind of like this, and especially if we do the, the weekly gatherings, uh, there is always kind of like uh, someone DJing. Uh, 
Nadia is actually a really good DJ. Um, so yeah, but people play uh, music from their regions uh, or music they like. Uh, and interestingly, what I noticed when uh, you start playing music, uh, that always kind of opens up a very different conversation in the beginning. So it makes it in a way uh, less formal, but it's also something that uh, people can relate to. So yeah, that's kind of a quick, a few quick comments on that. It's not sure what you would like to pick on, uh, uh, Gino, or is there any time left? Oh, I see that Jesper is kind of texting me desperately in capitals. We run out of time. <laughs> uh, that's not true, Bas. It was not capitals. Um, yeah, is there a final reflection that you want to share, Gina, Bas? Uh, just something we've, well, you feel like you've, you've maybe left out or prompted by some of the questions you want to leave us with? Yeah, well, just one final one. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a, uh, an interesting conversation with one of our, one of our donors. Um, we're also building a, a network, not so much kind of a learning network, um, DigiLabs. Um, and what I said, if you are planning to do this in whatever shape or form, my very brief advice would be don't over plan it, just do it. So it's basically like Nike said, just do it. Uh, start building uh, and kind of keep building. It's, it's kind of a dynamic process. Uh, I don't believe you can design a, a network from scratch <laughs> and, then, and then build it. Uh, you kind of have to design it while you're building it or building it while you're designing it. That's my final comment. Gina, perhaps one final thought? One final thought. I, I hate that thought, um, especially when you're about to fly. Um, <laughs> nothing final. <laughs> um, no, just to say maybe, I mean, I guess I don't think knowledge can be managed. Um, I think, you know, it can be created. It can be followed. Um, I really do think that, you know, kind of you're doing something with knowledge when you're staying curious and when you're being surprised all the time. Um, and that's kind of the behavior you're trying to mimic at an organizational level. Um, this idea of compartmentalizing it and locking it down and monetizing it um, is just the, is wrongheaded. Um, so, you know, get stay surprised every day is a better knowledge management strategy. Thanks, Gina and Bas. Uh, the, the last one, Gina, you should put that on a, on a t-shirt, I think. <laughs> um, thanks so much for uh, such a thoughtful presentation and reflection on, on your work. Obviously, it's ongoing, uh, evidently. Uh, this was uh, very inspiring, lots of things to build on. And also, thank you for all the great questions. Um, I mean, plenty of food for thought in there as well. So as always, enabling these learning collectives uh, is, is a very meaningful experience. So thank you for everyone for participating. Um, and speaking of renewal capability and conditions for scale, uh, there was a bit of a uh, session follow-up tonight, uh, which I think is very in line with that uh, around social R&D. We will be joined by Jason Pierman and Chris Vanstone from uh, Canadian government and uh, the Australian Center for Social Innovation. Uh, well, where we definitely will be talking about uh, what an R&D capacity can look like, not just in organizations, but in um, in, in a sector-wide sense. Um, so hopefully maybe seeing some of you there, uh, certainly it will be a great continuation of this really inspiring conversation. Um, but for now, um, thank you all for being part of this. And uh, hopefully James has a tune to, uh, to share uh, as we as we all kind of go to our next Zoom meeting or wherever we are going. Um, take care for now.